field, tagging from third is Suarez. Goodell comes running in. He's under it, makes the catch. Here's the throw to the plate. It's in the air. He is. What is going on? Welcome back to the Stupid Money Podcast. Alec here. Sean is on, I don't know, he's doing something with work. Let him go this week. I know we haven't had an episode in a while. We were struggling with scheduling conflicts with the both of us, but Alex is back to fill in, which we appreciate. So it's good to see you again, Alex. Yeah, thanks for having me. Good to be back. Yeah, it was good last time. So a lot, a lot has happened uh, since last time we spoke and the last time we had an episode we haven't had an episode since Emmett came on and everyone was doom and gloom about the harper injury things things have not been bad since then they're they're over 500 since harper is out but we're gonna get in all that we're gonna start with the stuff that just happened this past week with the all-star game of the draft uh, we're gonna start with the all-star game and kyle schwarber in the home run derby because i lost money i, I don't know if you lost money i mean i I, I thought he tied him. I, I don't know. There was a lot of things that were sketchy about that. I, I don't know what you thought. <laughs> yeah, I, I lost money, but I only threw a couple dollars on Pete just to emotionally hedge because I wouldn't have handled <laughs> him winning too well. Right. But um, yeah, I was I was counting as Schwarber was going. And first of all, I never saw Pujols' 13th get out, but all of a sudden that yeah. was on the scoreboard. And then next thing you know, Schwarber had 20 and they only gave him 19, so. It is what it is, but it it kind of sucked. Yeah, it sucked. I was a little disappointed with how he uh, performed, but I also thought ESPN's camera angles or whatever were like worse than usual. I thought like, and I think that might have confused. It confused me at times. It must have. Conf- yeah. I think it confused Carl Ravage too about what was going out and what wasn't. So I don't know exact if Schwarber definitely got host. It just felt that way. It was it was weird. It, it yeah, didn't make it didn't make sense at times. The, the broadcast definitely didn't do the the ticker any justice. But I almost with the way how it, it just seems so chaotic. Like going back to the ten outs would almost be better, just so you could follow each kind of individual swing and even it, like admire everything about it instead of almost getting whiplash trying to follow every yeah. single ball that's hit. Yeah, it, it does feel like it's rushed. I know it's like in a whole you know, TV thing. They're trying to make it not last. It still lasts like two and a half hours, but trying to make yeah. it last four. I get it. I don't know. There's, there's quicker ways to do it. Like let eight guys swing and whoever has the four most home run totals at the end of it, move on. There's, there are different ways yeah. to do this, but even it, like, it, I feel like the format's flawed. Cause even like moving on from Schwarber, Julio hit 81 Soto hit 52, but Soto won. Yeah. It, it, like, that, yeah. that just doesn't make sense. Now that, that was fun to watch them. Uh, play they might be future they might be teammates in a week who knows there's yeah. <laughs> there's a lot going on with that uh we'll get into that at the end of the show but that's another thing uh, all-star game wise nl loses again they've lost nine straight now I, I i i don't know why i don't know the all-star game to me is it's just like it's become like a pitching display in a way these guys are all throwing gas it feels like someone someone hit 103 or something the other last night i think yeah I know Klasse was sitting straight 100 with like 15 inches of run on every pitch, which is yeah. just ridiculous. Yeah, it was nuts. Uh, the offense, I think more people would be more interested if there was a lot more offense in that game. It's just really hard because yeah, the, the, you got the best of the best pitching. And they're only all these guys are only going one inning, sometimes two outs. So they're mm-hmm. throwing their best stuff available. Like they're not worried about the next inning or anything. So that's a reason why I think. The yeah. pitching is so far ahead, but yeah, All Star Game it is what it is. I, thought, I don't know; it just seems a little subdued this year for some reason. I, I, I did like the mic'd up stuff, though. That was cool. Yeah, especially with Alec Manoa, I thought his was really cool. Uh, yeah. The stuff with Cortez and Trevino being the battery was cool too. Yeah, they didn't really kind of they didn't really interact with the announcers as much as Manoa did, but I kind of liked like the back and forth with what was going on in their mind. I thought that was pretty neat. Yeah, I would have even taken it with like the announcers not even 
just asking them any questions, just like kind of yeah. hearing what they were going through and stuff. That would have been, that would have been cool yeah. too. Uh, so moving on, the draft was also this weekend on Sunday. Phillies drafted 17th, which was the, uh, the latest they've drafted in, I think since 2012, <laughs> 2013, something like that. Insane. Uh, so they take Justin Crawford, the son of Carl Crawford, outfielder. I know Sean likes him. Sean really likes him. He likes the speed. He likes the glove. I like the tools. I'm not really sold on the bat. I saw some charts. His whiff rate, his chase rates are really bad. I don't, I don't know what you think about him. Uh, just on the surface, I saw he hit 503 and slugged, or yeah, 503 and slugged 815 in a pretty good high school league. So the, the whiff chase rate might be a little high, but it seems like at the high competition that he was facing, he could put the bat on the ball relatively well, well enough, I guess. I saw an article on fan sided. It said that at this stage of his development, he was almost a more projectable Corbin Carroll, who's okay. the number three prospect in all of baseball right now. So I'd take that for sure. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I, I think the tools are good. Obviously, his dad being an MLB player helps, I think, a ton. Uh, they did not go pitcher. I think a lot of people, including myself, thought they might just continue that track because it's so hard to stockpile pitching. But they go hitter, and they went hitter third round, too. That's – yeah, I, I guess it depends on the sl- – they didn't have a lot of money to spend. No. I think they were, what, like $8.4 And I think Crawford's slot value is like 3.6, something like that. Because when I saw Brock Porter still there for them in the third round, I mm-hmm. thought they might take a shot at it. But I guess the money didn't really line up because he would have asked for probably more than Crawford. Yeah, this was uh this was an interesting draft. There were a lot of sons of MLB players in this draft. Matt Holiday's son went first overall. So uh it was an interesting draft. I kind of like how they they do it with the All-Star game now. I think it puts a little more buzz around it than them doing it on a Tuesday in June at the MLB mm-hmm. Network studio. I I, th- I think this is way better to do it. Oh yeah. I the first round was great to watch, I thought. Yeah, it was entertaining. And I think it doesn't drag like as the thing is there's not as much I guess hype and tension around it, like as the NBA and NFL drafts, because you can't trade picks because of that mm-hmm. whole slot value stuff. But I thought they made it a little more better for TV than in years past, so that was good. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I th- I feel like it's more enjoyable because I feel like the announcers don't try and insert themselves as much as like other sports drafts. They yeah, because kind of it, yeah, it's harder to predict, so they don't go with the "I told you so" or whatever, like yeah. some like Mike Mayock and those guys. Well, Mike Mayock's a GM now, but like yeah. what he used to do. So, yeah, so that was, was a good. It was an okay week. Uh, Schwarber did go over two in the All Star game. I forgot to mention that. So not not the greatest week for him. Still happy he got the nod though. Twenty nine home runs, uh, definitely deserved it. Carried the Phillies to their forty nine and forty three record at the break which is the last wild card spot because they own the tiebreaker over the Cardinals. And I think that is really the biggest takeaway from this first half is that they finished all their games with the Cardinals, all their games with the Brewers, all their games with the Padres, and they come out with the season series win versus all three of those teams, which now is important because there's no game 163. It comes down to head-to-head tiebreakers. Mm-hmm. Um. I, I wish they played every game in the Central because I feel like they own the Central Division, but I just feel yeah. like they since 2012 they just if it, it feels like they just beat up on the Cardinals and the Brewers. Yeah, I say I feel very confident. I, I I said this to my brother. I know we're getting a little ahead of here. If the Phillies, were, I'd rather the Phillies be like the six seed than the four, the five, because I am very confident in this team versus the Brewers or the Cardinals. Especially, I, we'll, we'll get into the deadline stuff, but yeah. like if they get a third starter, if you send out, I guess we have to, before we could just confidently plug in Nola, he has to get past September. Mm-hmm. But like this version of Nola, Wheeler, and then a third starter, that's going to be really tough to beat in a five-game series, even a seven-game series. Yeah, definitely, especially because the first round is just a three-game series now. So that mm-hmm. uh, having good starting pitching is really the most important thing. Uh, those two guys that you just mentioned are, I would say, the number one and number one A 
reason the Phillies are over 500 right now with the way the offense started with Segura's injury, with Harper's injury, with Cassianos not being good, with Real Muto being bad to start the year. I, I, I think the work those two guys done has just been incredible for this team. Yeah, I I think more specifically Noah going into the season. I, I think yeah. we all kind of expected this from Wheeler. But after the last couple of years of Noah, we weren't really sure what we were going to get. And the fact that he's looked very similar to 2018 when he was top three or four in the Cy Young is really promising for this the second half. I guess he just, again, has to prove that he could pitch in September when he always hits that roadblock every season. But it's definitely a promising first half for him. Yeah, the thing is you would like to like limit his innings right now so he's gonna go in september but because they're not it's not like they have a 10 game lead in the division or anything like he has to go all all out every night which makes it a little more difficult and is why we're going to get to about them the trade line them needing pitchers there's not a lot behind those two guys right now which is why i think rob thompson is pushing those two guys deeper into games because the bullpen is getting taxed the other three days because gibson's been inconsistent he's been better his last uh, few starts he's gone deeper into games but then Eflin's been out. Uh, Ranger Suarez was out, just returned. They were playing a lot of bullpen games. I mean, so the work those two guys did definitely helped. Yeah, I, I'm i I'm kind of out on Eflin. I just don't think you could trust him. Even when he comes back, he showed flashes, but he's. I'd say he's more inconsistently more towards bad than good, and his body just hasn't proved that it could hold up. So I'm probably – out on him in terms of a future option and just getting more help at the deadline because you can't really trust him. Yeah. I mean, that's unfortunate. I, you know, he's still young enough where you would like to keep him around, but the injuries are just racking up like crazy for, and the thing is it's the, it's the same thing. It's the knees that keep bothering him really. So you can't even say like, Oh, he's just been like, he's gotten weird injuries. Like he, he broke a finger or he sprained his ankle fielding first base. No, it's been the same exact thing over Mm -hmm. and over again, which is a major concern that's just not going to get better. And I think the worst part about it going into the season was Ranger was really good last year, but realistically you couldn't expect him to keep up that same pace. So he was kind of penciled in as the four and Gibson was the five. So Eflin was kind of your three. And like at the start of the season, if you got into a three game series in the playoffs, Eflin was probably going to be your third game starter unless you bring one of the top two back on short rest. And he just can't be trusted. So, and the other two haven't, Ranger and Gibson haven't been good enough that you could confidently move them up to that three spot. Yeah. So, I mean, we're going to get into that. It looks like starting pitching, it's going to be the number one thing for them to look at the next couple of weeks. But I want to get your thoughts on, let's see, two things that surprised you in a good way in the first half and two things in a bad way. Um, I'd say one thing that, start with good Hoskins Hoskins never really hit that he hit like a couple a week skid Mm -hmm. early towards the beginning of the season but then he got really hot and it lasted for maybe a week and a half or two weeks and then it's like oh here comes the two two and a half three week colds uh stretch that always follows but it kind of just steadied out he never really hit that cold stretch then he kind of got more hot than cold towards the end of the first half so it seems like he was a lot more consistent, and that, that was huge with Bryce going out. Yeah. And then something else that surprised me was the bullpen. But I think oh, yeah. some of that was Thompson's usage of them. I think he kind of established roles and was going off of what they could currently do and not because Familia was good five years ago, he automatically gets the eighth inning. I think he kind of sorted it out and – knew where he wanted to go with people. I think he had more of a plan. So I think that definitely helped. And I think they're, they've been like a top seven bullpen in the league. And then, yeah, Rangers kind of been a bad surprise. Yeah. I I thought he, I thought he was going to decline a little bit, but he's just been really bad. And I think it's more so his mannerisms. Like last year he was kind of just stone faced, got through anything and just worked out of it. But now he'll miss two or three fastballs in a row on his arm side out of the zone. And he'll like start banging his glove or just like talking to himself. And it just, it's not the same composure that was there last year. So that'd be, that'd be nice to get figured out. 
Yeah, they, I think they definitely, if they're going to make a run, he needs to, I'm not saying he needs to get back to where he was last year because that's almost an impossible ask. But yeah. if he can just be somewhere in the middle, down the stretch, that would be huge for them. He was really good in Miami. Yeah, he was. I was surprised because I knew there was his first time back uh, coming off of the injury. That that was that was really nice to see. I mean, they pitched incredibly well down in Miami. They gave up one run in three I think games. They had, I think they had 24 consecutive scoreless innings to end that series. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was great to see that. Uh they needed that. The pitching staff needed that. And they just I feel like they needed that going into the break because they didn't finish that Cardinal series the way any of us would have liked dropping the last two after winning the first two. And then I think we kind of expected Toronto to be chalked because of, you know, they couldn't have everybody because of the whole vaccine mandate. So, you know, to come into Miami, the place that's given you probably the most problems over the last three years and sweep them, especially with Alcantara on the mound in game one, that, that was, I think, so big for them going into the yeah. break. I think going back to Toronto, I feel like the Miami series was even bigger because, like you said, we all kind of chalked Toronto up. But the way that the games went, if you would have said that the bullpen game was the close game and the Wheeler game was the blowout, uh, I don't think anybody would have been too thrilled yeah. about that. I think we w much would have rather the other way around. But, I mean, they, they rebounded as well as you could have asked for. So it was good momentum. Yeah, it was. I was a I was a little worried about Wheeler at that game. That 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 was a little ugly. But uh, yeah. hopefully, I think we see him in game two after the break. I'm pretty sure Gibson leads yeah. off. Uh, is going to lead off the second half on Friday against the Cubs, which brings us to the point of the second half because they have 70 games left now. They're tied for the last wild card spot, but 43 of those last 70 games are against teams under 500 realistically, I, I think you could, should win 30 of those games. I mean, you're playing the Nationals. It looks like you figured out the Marlins for once. Nah, the, I, I can't go that far yet. I but. mean, we'll see. It, it's looking, they're 5-1 five, five and one against them in the last six, so yeah. they played better. Uh, the Diamondbacks, who, when we saw them in Philly, they were like an average team. They've really fallen off. Mm-hmm. And then you see, we see the Cubs, um, the seven times we see them starting Friday in the second half, the seven times you see the Pirates in the second half, and the seven times you see the Reds in the second half, along with the Nationals, who very well could be without Juan Soto a week from now. So, I mean, to, to say they could win 30, go 30 and 13, like 28 and 15, somewhere around there, I don't think is that tall of an ask. No, it definitely shouldn't be. That's... That's more than realistic, I I think. Yeah, I mean, just try to win two out of three in every single one of those series. You know, I, I, I don't think it's impossible, especially if you add at the deadline. And then if you just kind of tread against those other teams, you play the Braves mm -hmm. a lot. I think they have six or seven against the Mets. So yeah. I mean, those will be some tough games. But there's not a lot of tough out-of-division games. I think they go... They go to San Francisco, and they, they well have, even San Francisco's kind of fallen off a little bit. Yeah, I think they're a, that lineup has finally caught up with them. I feel like a bit. It's just yeah. a very overachieving team at times. I feel like so yeah. that that's another one. They're another team. Uh, the Phillies have to keep an eye on in terms of the wild card. So I know they end in Houston. I know that that still is a series with the winning record. They they finished with Houston because of the the lockout they got thrown on at the end. Yeah, uh, that the way I feel about that, I kind of hope the Astros are locked up by then. I know they'll they'll probably be vying for maybe the top seed so they get home field advantage versus the Yankees if they were to yeah. face off. Maybe the Yankees will be too far gone by then. So I mean, hopefully we don't see like Verlander and Valdez in those two games. That would, yeah. that would be nice. It might be four game series actually. No, it's three game. I think it's um, three. Yeah. So you know that that could actually be that on paper that looks like a tough series, but if they're locked up, that might actually be one of the easier series you have left, especially if you're still fighting. So we'll see there. Um, a lot, a lot of interesting games. They're at forty nine. I think they might have to win thirty eight to forty one in this second half to make the playoffs. Gets them into the 
the 88 to 90 win range. Yeah, 90 I, would be great. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, because the thing is, the the Cardinals also have, I, I think the Phillies have the fourth easiest schedule of any team in baseball in yeah, they do. the second half. But I'm pretty sure the National, or I'm sorry, the Cardinals are number one because they have a lot of games left with the Reds, the Pirates, which, I mean, they play those two teams 19 times. That's Yeah, their their division does them a lot of favors. Yeah, it's it certainly does. Uh, and the Cubs, I'm sorry. Yeah, all three of those. They play all three. I mean. Yeah, the, the Pirates are in third in that division, I think. Yeah, it is. I mean, all three of those teams are, I think, 15 games or more under 500, which is ridiculous. Then you look at, like, the AL East where every team is 500 or better. It's just insane that you have divisions that are that lopsided at times. Yeah. I So for the trade deadline, I, I thought the first two months we were going to be in this whole uh, Soto from the Tigers, Bednar from the Pirates, Barlow from the Royals. Like the we're going to be in the huge closer market, mm-hmm. giving up an arm leg for a closer. I think Rob Thompson has, in a way, settled that down where these guys – are comfortable with what they're doing you know brad hand can close he's close before so he's going in there uh dominguez is taking the highest pressure situation which could be the seventh it could be the eighth it could be the ninth i think that's the best role for him uh we're gonna get brogdon back out here again he's looked good for a couple months now canables looked good since coming out of the closers role it seems like his command his control has gotten a lot better he's not walking a ton of guys as much anymore just going to see. So I don't think they need the marquee bullpen guy. I think you can, if you want to bring David Robertson back from the Cubs, go ahead. If I, I like Mantiply from the Diamondbacks because yeah. he's a lefty. I yeah. think he, I think he bodes well with this team. So I, he's kind of my number one bullpen target right now. I don't know if you have any thoughts on a bullpen guy. Yeah. I mean, I'm still not. I mean, I love Veerling, but I'm still mm-hmm. not completely sold on center field, so I'd maybe call the Royals and see what like a Taylor Barlow package would be like. Just because if you're if you're kind of expending Sir Anthony in the highest leverage situation, if it's in the seventh, I'd kind of like another righty to have back there and not just worry about like, oh, Knabel could go pitch the ninth because we've seen how that's been. Yeah. And even since he's been better, the ninths with him still haven't been like clean, like the one in St. Louis. Even though Boehm kind of did that to him, but uh, it wasn't her. it wasn't the cleanest inning. And I I don't know if I fully trust Bellotti for the ninth. No, so not a, I, not a I, playoff game. I think, definitely. Another, I think another righty wouldn't be a bad thing if you're going to just expend Sir Anthony wherever the biggest fire could be. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I agree. I'm I'm kind of out on Bedner because I think it would be too much of a haul. I I think they've they've calmed things down enough back there that they don't need the the all star. Even yeah. though Mantiply is an all star, I don't think they need the full on five year of control that Bedner is and the prospects that it would take to get that done. Yeah, I I think that would start with Abel. I I could see that. I I I saw a report the Phillies are willing. To deal everybody not named Abel Painter McGarry. Yeah, I saw that too. Yeah, which I'm fine with. Um, I, I think that package honestly might start with Abel or McGarry. I'm not sure. I, I also saw some other things from Pirates fans that they think Bednar was kind of overworked in the first half because he was really the only reliable arm for them out there. And that towards yeah. the end of the first half, his stuff wasn't as sharp. And there's a couple of miles off his fastball. Now, maybe the officer break corrected that for him he did pitch in the all-star game but we'll see in the you know next week or two but i i think that's not really the way to go uh you bring up the barlow taylor package i actually saw that uh robbie hyde who has a youtube channel on baseball he brought that exact trade up so uh that's an interesting one to watch i think center field i think they do need a center fielder Taylor's kind of, if you want to go on the the low end, you know, just kind of get us through till we get Segura and and uh, Bryce back. But a guy I've started to talk myself into a little more that is going to cost a little more uh, is Ian Happ on the Cubs. I mean, I saw mm-hmm. Schwarber hanging out with him at the All-Star game and stuff, and he's at least 
he's a game changer in the lineup. Like he could, he's a guy who can bat anywhere. I think from one to six switch hitter. Yeah. I, I think he'd be incredibly valuable for them. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know if he's up after this year or next year. I'm not exactly sure what his contract situation yeah. is. I'd have to um, look. I like, that's one of the reasons I do like the, the Crawford pick a little bit. It kind of makes Rojas expendable. Mm-hmm. You move him, and that's a, that's, their system's solid. Um, I, I saw an article the other day with, uh, I think it's Lee coming back, the one middle infielder. Prospect. Oh, yes, yes. I, th- I think I they said he's on the verge of breaking the top 100, so they might have five or six top 100 prospects soon. So the system's getting there, and it's it's very top-heavy. So you could move maybe like if you're looking at Ian Happ, maybe like a Rojas and like a Ben Brown who's be who's proving to be like very projectable and they're developing him really well. So that might be a, the start of an Ian Hat package. If you're yeah. calling the Cubs. Yeah. I saw Ben Brown had a pretty good start the other day, like seven scoreless innings with 10 yeah. or 12 K's or something like that. Uh, so Hap, you get Hap the rest of this year's age 27 season. And then he's in his last year of arbitration next year at age 28. So, I mean, that's definitely one that I would look into because it helps you next year too. And then you could, you know, Crawford and Rojas kind of seem like similar players from their scouting reports, speed guys, good glove waiting for the mm-hmm. bat to catch up. So I, I, you know, just having one of them is fine. You don't need both, I guess, but yeah. Yeah. Hap, Hap has kind of become my number one bat. I was on for a little bit. I mentioned this to Sean. I was kind of on the Brandon Drury train when Segura was out and you could put him at second, you could put him at third DH Bohm. But now it's, it looks, I mean, Segura has been fielding ground balls. I I'd be surprised if he's not back by later than maybe August 10th or so. So I, I'm kind of out on adding a middle infielder. Yeah. And even I saw a lot of reports with like Drury going to third and I mean, Bohm's been hitting like 340, somewhere between 340 and like 370 since June 5th. Mm-hmm. Like the, the bat's starting to come around to what we saw rookie year, and it seems like he's getting more comfortable at third. So I'm not really in favor of just throwing him off or moving him to DH because it seems like he's getting in a rhythm. And yeah, Gene, it seems like Gene's speeding up the rehab process. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of out on jury, but I, I did see that a lot, and it, it just seems like the Reds are trying to drive up the market. I know for Castillo, they asked the Yankees for Volpe or Peraza. <laughs> yeah, I did see so, that. I don't, yeah, that. I don't know what they're they're going with over there, but it seems like their cost is pretty high. Yeah, I think they're trying to maybe rebuild their farm system because the the whole Winker Suarez trade. I don't think netted them a ton, and they. You know, they a lot of guys walked out of there for free, including Cassianos. So, I, you know, they're probably just trying to make up a little bit of a farm system there. I think so. Number one uh, trade target has to be starting pitching. There's yeah. a lot of names, thankfully. Uh, Castillo, as you said, Maley, also on the Reds, just came, is supposed to come back from injury this weekend. Noah Syndergaard, since the Angels are like 27 games under 500, so it's being 10 games over 500. It uh, looks like they might be sellers because he's on a one-year deal. He's a name that's come up. Martin Perez, the all-star from the Rangers, another name that's come up. Kyle Hendricks did come up. I don't know if he's been hurt, though, or something. He's kind of, That's kind of tied, died down. So there's some options. Uh, there's also Merrill, Merrill Kelly on the Diamondbacks, too. I'm kind of in the boat where I would honestly – I don't need, like, Castillo – Give, like get rid of all my prospects. I would take like two guys. Like I would take like Perez and Merrill Kelly and just try to deepen my pitching rotation, which has been as shallow as it gets. Yeah. I mean, they kind of tested the waters with Falter and Sanchez and Sanchez hasn't looked awful, but I mean, no. Falter has not looked good at all. So I'm, I'm kind of with you in the same boat. I don't really need like the Montas Castillo even Perez, I I don't really – I don't know what their cost would be because last year they dealt Gibson when he was an all-star, and it was kind of – like Spencer was rated highly. Yeah. But, 
we we've seen how he's been and so they kind of threw Gibson away for cheap and I don't know if they do the same with Perez but I'm I'm more in the market for I like I like Tyler Maley from the Reds mm-hmm. but he's he's a young guy with some control left so I don't know what their price would be on him I I wouldn't trade any of the top 3 guys for him no but yeah I like I like Kelly I think Kelly's good and he'd be a good four or five depth piece that you could kind of throw out if you want to stretch out to like a six man rotation to give Nola or give Wheeler an extra day and cut down on some of their innings. So I I'd be in that market too, I think. Yeah. The only, the only argument for getting a Castillo, a Melee or a Montas is the fact that as we just said, uh, we don't want Eflin back here next year. Gibson is unlikely to be re-signed. So you're pretty much down to next year. Nola, who will need a new contract after next year, I'm pretty sure. Wheeler, who has a year or two, I think, left on his contract after this year. And then Suarez, who's been inconsistent. So they they do need two spots to fill. So getting a guy and also having next year in mind isn't the worst thing. I, I'm just not sure what their thought process is going to be at the deadline. Yeah, I don't know. Maley's numbers haven't been great this year, I don't think. But he is – he. He's he has good stuff and he's a young guy, so they would probably, I'd think they'd probably start with maybe McGarry, yeah. Which I don't, I'd almost, I'd rather just see what McGarry could do in the majors than, because his his strikeout rate being thirty six percent is like ridiculous. Yeah, it is insane. The Phillies they got some hard throwers down there, which is it's good to see because that has not been <laughs> been the case in the past really. Uh, to close out here, I. I missed a couple things I did want to talk about. And that was the move. So when Harper got hurt originally, they're like, okay, we're going to put Cassianos at DH. And then we're just going to make our defense better by playing Moniac slash Herrera slash Verling, two of those three in the outfield every day. And like, we're going to correct all the defensive problems. And then the offense didn't hit. So they were like, all right, we have to go offensive minded the decision to bring up Derek Hall and make him the DH and just let him slug. I think honestly, if they make the playoffs and Harper comes back and Segura comes back, I think we point at that and say that that might've saved the season. Yeah. I mean, Schwarber just needed another lefty bat that could kind of at least slug the av- I mean, the average isn't awful, but you kind of know what you're getting with Hall. Yeah. He's not going to like poke singles. He's going to hit for some sort of high slug percentage which Castellanos really hasn't been doing. And your other lefties in the lineup weren't providing anything outside of Schwarber in terms of the power department. So, yeah, that was that was a major move. I liked that they kind of just threw him right into the fire, too. They just put him right mm-hmm. in the field spot on his debut. They didn't really mess around and kind of guide him up from the eight hole to the six. They kind of just threw him right in and said, we know you could do, now go do it. Yeah, I think even Kruk mentioned that on the first couple of broadcasts when Hall came up. He's like, I'm glad they did that because they put him where he's hit his entire career. All through the minors, Derek Hall has been the cleanup guy because he's been the power guy. Just put him where he's comfortable, and they did that. So I think that was another good decision on their part to put him there. They've uh, they've done kind of well with guys they've brought up this year. I think you know Sanchez and Falter have made some decent spot starts. Pell was good when he came up for his few games. So I've been happy with uh, that part of the game for them. I So I think the last question I have to ask is when Segura comes back and let's say Cassianos is still kind of doing what he's doing right now, would you move Segura into the three spot? Because I've thought about doing that. Um, I'd almost, I'd like Segura in the two and Hoskins in the three maybe. Okay. But that's, I... I hesitate to do that too, even though like it sounds better in terms of like if you're looking at percentages with slug and stuff. Mm-hmm. But like I said earlier, like Reese has proved to be pretty consistent or at least more consistent than normal. Yeah. So maybe I just throw Segura in the three so Hoskins doesn't get out of rhythm and he kind of keeps the same mentality approach and doesn't really try and change anything. Yeah, I can see that. I think <laughs> Best case, if it's September 1st and this team's lineup is Schwarber, Segura, Harper, Hoskins, Cassianos, like Stott, 
uh, Ian Happ, Real Muto, and Bohm. Like I, I think that they have a very legitimate chance at making some noise in the playoffs with that lineup. Yeah, I think that's not to be like the cliche, the biggest additions they could make are blank from injury, but they don't yeah. really need to go bat shopping because the the plans right now are lining up that Harper and Sigur will be back towards late August. So they'll still have a month with both of those guys in the lineup as long as everything goes according to plan. So they could kind of just look for pitching, whether it's depth or a third like a third kind of number two or top tier three yeah. guy that they could throw in the rotation. The offense could kind of just steady the ship like they've been doing with whether it's just like a big hit here or there or the, the 10 run games that we saw in Miami. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's shaping up to be an exciting finish for once for us. I think, you know, September is always the month that we hold our breath on, but I, the schedule, as we've mentioned, is not bad at all. I mean, 43 out of 70 games against teams under 500. And when we mean under 500, I'm pretty sure the Marlins are the closest team to 500 out of that bunch, and they're still six games under. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, like, this is not, like, teams treading water, really. These are teams that – and honestly, the good thing is they've played the they've played the good teams in the first half. They play the bad teams in the second half. What happens in the second half? The good teams get better. The bad teams gets get worse because the trade deadline. Right. So this is really honestly set up as ideal as they could have asked. Even you know with losing the MVP to a broken thumb, losing arguably your best all around hitter to a broken finger. Two of your two of your five starters have been bad. You had to fire your manager. I I think all that considered. We'll take this first half, and I think they have a golden opportunity in the second half. Yeah, I I agree. And uh, if you take away the Mets, they haven't really – they've played the good teams pretty well. If, like, they just – I don't have any numbers to back that up, but just from watching 95% of the games, if you take away the Mets series, I feel like they've played the good teams pretty competitively. Yeah, I think I, I had it written down one point. They're 0 and 4 against the Rangers, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. They're they're 0 and 4 against the Rangers and yeah, 3 and 3 9 and 9 against the, against the Mets and then I think they're only a game or two under 500 against the Braves and then everyone else that like means something, they're over 500 against. Yeah. Except the Giants are 1 and 2, but they'll see them again. So I mean, yeah, it, it they have played well except for one team that they play that they see seven one out of every 10 games is just against them in the second half so it's not the worst thing in the world yeah um and all like all the Mets games were pre-Thompson so they don't really count yeah that, that exactly that's that is true actually we have not faced the Mets since Thompson came the manager so that will be interesting to see in those seven games in the second half because I, I just I guarantee you that if Thompson was the manager Nick Plummer does not hit a home run even no, if that, was pitching, no. I guarantee you it doesn't happen. <laughs> no, that doesn't happen. They don't blow a uh, six-run lead in the ninth. Yeah. And oh, so, I, I, I tried to forget about that one. Yeah, that uh, Sean's. If Sean listens to this, you can hate me for freaking that up because I bring it up like every episode. But you know, it's whatever. All right, so that's gonna do it for this episode. Uh, sorry for the break, the three-week break. Uh, we're gonna try to make these weekly again. Depends. Sean is just really busy, and I have other stuff going on too with the other podcast starting another one so we're gonna we're gonna try to figure this out uh i'm alec alex thanks for coming on again appreciate it yeah thanks for having me yep all right so we'll see you all next time